Good morning, Port Ritchie. Good morning, Hudson, Newport Ritchie, and all our surrounding communities. Good morning, all those who have been joining us here in our virtual worships. We welcome you. We welcome you into our cyber church as we continue to deal with COVID-19 and keeping one another safe. Good morning. A few brief announcements. Um, here at King of Kings, uh, we are going solo this morning. Uh, Lutheran Church of the Palms has a new pastor. She started this past week, and we wish them well, and we ask that we, that we all keep them in our prayers as they continue to grow in their relationship with God as we grow in ours. And speaking of growing in your relationship with God, uh, we had a meeting last night with the council and it's decided that we want to move forward and reestablish some of the committees that used to serve our church to take some of the pressure off the individual council members, but also inviting others to be involved, to give their gifts and their talents of time and ability and knowledge and experience back to God through these offerings. So the first three committees that we want to establish is A, a property committee a, uh, or a building and grounds committee, if you will. So if you have some background in building maintenance or construction or even business or even just a desire to serve, please contact the church. Uh, but there's also those of you out there who might be shy, you might be getting a call and while the call might come from a very human person, that call is also coming from God. So please consider that call that you receive. That's the first committee. The second committee will be around finance so we can have more of a team that rather than it falling on just a very few people, that we can have more of a team that are dealing with our church's finances as very real things that we need to deal with being part of this culture and this world. We need to have you know, sound finances. We need to keep one another accountable through the accounting of the, the gifts and tithes that we receive. And the third, and I understand there's already a committee out there, it's just people that have served in it. So if you're still interested in being part of that committee, Carol Kunzen, um, yes, we're gonna start a worship and music committee because we wanna start planning for the transition. This COVID-19, this coronavirus, will start dropping off someday where we can start looking at different ways of worshiping. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about that's been brought to me, and I agree, when the weather gets nicer, that it's not 90 degrees by 10 o'clock in the morning and the humidity isn't soaking your pasture through, we might start trying to do a drive-up service where we drive up and we park in the back, we can keep our windows rolled up or just cracked enough to get ventilation and do some sort of a broadcast through an FM where you would listen to on your, your, your car radio and you could sing along. We don't know yet. This is why it'd be nice to have people who are inspired by the act of worship and putting together the worship and the music to be part of that committee. So again, if any of those three areas interest you, whether it be the building and grounds, whether it be finances, or whether it be the worship and music of the church. Give Barbara a call, send her an email, let her know that you're interested and someone will contact you in due time. I don't know if we have any other announcements. Any you can think of? Yes. All right then, let us begin then. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We, we fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our whole benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. 
so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also Thanks. with you. Please join me in reading the prayer of the day. Glorious, Glorious God, God, your, your generosity, generosity waters, waters the world with goodness, with goodness and, and your, your cover creation with, with abundance. abundance. Awaken, Awaken in us in a, a hunger for food that satisfies both body and spirit. spirit. And with, with this, this food, fill, fill all, the all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of prophet Isaiah. How everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that that is not bread, and your labor for the, which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made a, him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Let us read responsively Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are good to all. And your compassion is over all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall. And lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord. And you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand. And satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are righteous in all your ways. And loving in all your works. You are near to all who call upon you. To all who call upon you faithfully. You fulfill the desires of those who fear you. And you hear their cry and save them. You watch over all those who, you love, who love you. But all the wicked you shall destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless God's holy name forever and ever. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. 
When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I, I really love this gospel text. But before we get to it, I have something to get off my chest. I have come to the conclusion, and I had a sneaking suspicion before, and I've heard other people say it and tried to debate it in my head, but I have come to the conclusion that we really do live in a pagan society. We might represent ourselves as Christian, which really we are not a Christian society. We might have Christian churches and Christians living among society, practicing the gospel and trying to bring the good news and talking about the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. We might have that at present, but as a society, we are not Christian. We're not even pluralistic because regardless of what religion people pra say they practice, our culture practices paganism. We worship an untrue God. Now, who is this God? Who is this God that we worship? Well, like anything, when you're talking about that divine or even pseudo divine, it's not always clear. But let's put it as I really think the God that our culture wor worships can be best characterized by the word wealth. We worship the God of wealth. And this is obvious by how we prioritize those things in our society and it seems no matter what people say they believe in who they worship as a society the priority becomes wealth we set those who are wealthy and the pursuit of gaining wealth at the foremost and even if those who are not really wealthy they pretend to be wealthy or they try to show their wealth or to show their devotion to this God of wealth through copious consumption. So we get things that we can say by these things we show we are wealthy and we have wealth and we worship the God of wealth. And we continue to consume and consume and consume and put our priorities towards this acquisition of wealth. And this wealth is not just a simple God. It's a triune God because the wealth has come to us by the form of capitalism. And this idea that you can go out and work and apply yourself and build yourself up and generate wealth that then you have for yourself. So you worship the Father through the Son. You worship the wealth through the practice of capitalism. And to complete this pagan triune, we had that third piece, the economy. We worship the wealth and the capitalism and the economy together as one thing all wrapped up as part of our lives. And you know why I say this? Because when you read the Bible, there are many passages anywhere between 30 to 100, depending on how you read, 
that God is either acknowledging or condemning people for sacrificing their children to this pagan God. And now we have this discussion going on through our society of whether or not we open schools because until we open the schools, we can't get the economy up and running and start generating through capitalism wealth again. So we are willingly or unwillingly being called upon to sacrifice our children. And just like those pagan times as recorded through history or in the Bible, it is not necessarily the leader's children or those in charge or those who have been blessed by the God of wealth who get sacrificed. It's the rest of our children who get sacrificed. And it follows because we've sacrificed ourselves we sacrifice our time, and now why don't we just sacrifice our future to that God of wealth? Because until we get that economy up and running, until we start generating wealth, we cannot recover from this pandemic. The words from the prophet Isaiah jumped out at me with this. Why do we spend our time for that which is not bread. And when God is using the word bread in this passage, it's not referring to that baked thing that we put in an oven and forms the basis of many good sandwiches. God is referring to that which sustains us, that which holds us together, that which builds us up and keeps us going. And yes, Food is important because, as my stomach tells me every day about 1 o'clock if I've not eaten lunch, I'm hungry. But when it comes right down to it, is that really what sustains us? Because as I've looked at my, the reading on the scale, I could probably go for a couple days without eating and it really wouldn't hurt me. So I don't think that God is talking about food when, we, when God questions through the prophet Isaiah, why do we spend our time for that which does not satisfy us, for a bread that does not satisfy? And he goes on, come and I will give you this bread, this satisfaction of the soul and the spirit and the body for no money. Come, drink by the waters and be refreshed. It was some time ago in my life, and I've recognized lately that it didn't have, or it did have um, a lot to do with the fact that I was growing in my faith, that I was taking seriously the call to spend more time praying to God. And I'm talking about years and years before I ever went to seminary, before I ever answered that, that call. But that working and putting money into the bank, when we made that our priority in our lives, we ended up sacrificing a lot of very important things for that. And I'm just as guilty, and I'm still just as guilty, of getting caught into that idolatrous relationship with wealth. But I sacrificed chances to see my children in school plays, chances to spend time with them discovering nature. I sacrificed time to get away and refresh myself through vacation because, well, you got to make the mortgage payment and, you know, working in construction, it really is true. You got to save for the time that work is not there. You got to, you got to put a, you have to have something in the bank. However, there is no way that wealth satisfies that deep desire that we have, that deep hunger that we have. Because if wealth was the answer, more people, when they established a fortune, would quit and say, 
I've earned enough. Because the reality is, how many houses can you live in in one time? How many cars can you drive at one time? How many rich meals can you eat on top of rich meals until you have to go on a diet? Until the doctor says, your blood work came back and your cholesterol is high and your triglycerides are high and if I continue to see these numbers then we're going to have to take some more drastic measures. See, if wealth satisfied then we could stop. We could have enough and stop. But wealth is a cruel taskmaster. Now we get to the how I'm dealing with this sermon or this uh, gospel passage. So, Jesus is, hears about his friend, his probably his cousin in a sense, John the Baptist, the one who came before him and heralded Jesus' coming, has been beheaded. And he decides to go off and get away and take some time in prayer, in retreat. But the crowds followed him. So when he got ashore, the crowd was there. So he spent time with them, tending to their needs, healing and casting out demons and tending to their needs. When evening came, the disciples say, you better send them away because we're out here in the wilderness and there's not a Publix, or a Walgreens, or a Winn-Dixie, or any McDonald's out here to get them food. So they got to go into the surrounding villages and get fed. And Jesus says, no, no, we'll feed them. What do we have? And they say, well, we got, all we have is five loaves of bread. I don't know how big the loaves were. I think of a big hoagie roll. Um, and two fish. Again, we're not talking about groupers here. We're talking about probably something the size of a trout or herring. Not a huge fish. Enough meager portion for maybe the 12 and Jesus, but not for a crowd of 5,000 men. And 5,000 men plus women and children. So it was probably closer to 10,000 people. Jesus said, well, no, bring it here. Blessed it. He said, start giving it out. Now, I've heard pastors and other theologians say that it was the generosity of him willing to share that people brought out from under their cloaks, those supplies and those provisions that they brought with them because who would come out into the wilderness without some food? But the language is clear in the Bible. The Greek is clear that Jesus fed. They did not feed themselves. That Jesus fed them. I truly believe that Jesus was able to multiply that meager provision into enough that fed everybody their fill. Plus, there were 12 baskets left over. And we all know what the 12 means. 12 baskets, the 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 baskets of leftovers gathered up. Now, I wish I could say I knew how this happened. I wish I could say and explain to you scientifically how this occurred. I can't. I can only say that I believe, as a matter of faith, that God was present and fed those people in the wilderness as it's recorded. Multiplied that meager provision into enough. I don't know how to tell you it happened. But I can offer one insight. He started with a little something. While it's not recorded in this gospel, it's recorded in another one that it was a young boy who gave him the provisions that he had uh, with him, whether he was planning to sell them among the crowd or whatever, but he had five loaves of bread and two fish and he gave them to the disciples. He gave it as an offering. 
It started with somebody offering up what they had at one point, regardless of where the bread came from, because the disciples weren't actively working at the time. It was the benefit of somebody's gift that gave them those five loaves and those two fish. And while it seemed very meager when compared to 10,000 people, my point is it started with one simple act, no matter how small, of generosity. That's my first observation. My second observation is a little bit more long-winded, and I'm going to tell you a story. Um, when I was going through my theological education, when I was, um, those years that I spent in seminary, one of the requirements at the time for me, for where I went, was to take a global mission trip. Now, don't confuse a global mission trip as where you go and help somebody paint their house. I mean, it doesn't, that's not what it means. Most mission trips really aren't about going and working, or I should say many, some are, but they're not going about and, and offering your, your labor to help people rebuild. Many of them are about a cultural exchange. It gives you a chance to develop relationships with people and see how Christianity handles situations in different cultures to give you an idea of the possibilities about how we can take some of those ideas and use them in, in our culture. Well, in the midst of this, in this cultural, uh, global cultural time, we spent 17 days in India. Uh, we, we, we stayed in three places. We stayed in a th uh, seminary, in the guest quarters of a seminary in Bangalore, and we stayed at a combination uh, school and seminary in the city of Mangalore, with an M, Mangalore, which I actually like Mangalore, was a smaller city of, uh, I think maybe it was a half a million people, which was a little bit more of a, in scale as opposed to Bangalore, with just this sprawling metropolis with bad air. And uh, the last place we were is, was Mumbai, which we know more, uh, probably more clearly as Bombay, which is not Bombay anymore, it's Mumbai, which is one of the biggest cities in the world. While we were staying in Mangalore, we had took a couple field trips. And I remember this one day, this, uh, we had a whole itinerary of stuff planned this day. And we started the day going to this uh, plantation where the guy who ran the plantation was using techniques that he had been taught, of all places, the United States, um, that for farming, for companion planting, where he would plant two or three crops together in a plot, in, a, in an area, because they would help each other. One crop would needed shade to grow in, so the other crop provided a shade for it. And a third crop needed something to climb on. And they took different nutrients and they added different nutrients back in the soil that would help the other crops grow. And it's the one, remember the one crop would actually drip um, liquid into the soil. So it almost like continually watered the other two, which needed almost like a tiny drip irrigation. It was fascinating what this guy did. He, he bored large um, bore wells into the side of the mountain so that those great monsoons, they could capture the, some of the volume of the rain and store it for the dry season so they could keep the land irrigated. And it really was almost a Garden of Eden. And uh, it was a wonderful experience to start the day. Now, I would like to say that the day went up from there, but it didn't. kind of went sideways because our next visit was to a Jain temple, and Jain is one of those religions of India, and it's kind of on the decline. And we were warned, don't give any money to the priest because he's just going to go out and buy beer with it. So we go to see this temple and try to read something about the history of this religion. And the priest is there, and he wants money. And we're, no, no, we're not giving you money. Well, then he got nasty and started insulting us. And, uh, you know, it's not fun to be a place and to be getting insulted. Um, so from there we went to a senior center, or old age home, and um, 
it was a nightmare, the, the conditions that people were living under there, but this is where people who could not be cared for anymore by their families or did not have a family were left to go and live out their final days. And it was really, it brought back bad memories of going to a poorhouse once and seeing a relative who was there years and years ago between the smell and the dirt and the, just the, the sadness. And start, things started to go into a blur of the things that we were doing. But we were constantly driving to places. Now, I don't know how many people have traveled, but I know that roads in India had a unique traffic culture. Um, if there was two lanes, one traveling north and one traveling south, as you were driving down the road, there was always somebody passing somebody going both ways. So whether you were sitting, whether you were in the lane passing or sitting in your directional lane, there was always somebody coming at you in this extended game of chicken. And uh, I can tell you sitting in the front seat of the little bus we were in that I kind of wore out the imaginary brake many times trying to, <laughs> to deal with this. So you have this kind of stress all the time while you're driving. Um, we sat through some sort of culture presentation. I can't remember it, but here's where the story picks up, and this is where I know there's some pictures. We, one of our last stops was going to be the birthplace of Krishna, and there was a shrine there. And uh, you took off your shoes, as you do in many cultures. I, obviously, I don't know why Christians don't take their shoes off, but in many cultures, before you enter into a holy space, you take your shoes off. Maybe it's because we're more northern European and you don't take your shoes off where it's cold. I don't know, but you take your shoes off before you go into the shrine. So I'm walking through the shrine barefoot and I just didn't, I wasn't feeling it. I mean, usually when I go into somebody else's place of worship, I can feel something there, but I just wasn't feeling it. And it might've been the fact that I've been playing chicken for six hours, sitting in cars, or I'd just seen enough I was wearing out, I was tired. I just wasn't feeling it. Well, you go and you take the tour through the temple and you come out the side door and to go back where you leave your shoes, you had to walk by Splats the elephant. Now, I don't know if the elephant's name was Splats, that's what I called him because Splats had left little deposits all around and some had been scraped up and some were sitting there fresh and there was a nice one that was dropped right as I was walking by. And then you're walking by barefoot in a strange land. I was just feeling very uncomfortable. And we had one more stop. And we had told our guide, our host, that, uh, listen, we're all pretty tired and we don't know if we can do. He goes, well, no, no. He goes, I, I cancel, but they've already called me and they said they've prepared a special meal and they expect you there and they are looking forward to your visit. It was an orphanage, and I didn't know what to expect because we had visited some orphanages already, the ones that were set up by Sister Teresa's Society where they're taking in the children that were literally picked off the junk uh, yards because they were left to die, um, because they had minor conditions that could have been taken care of at birth, but now they were still living with them as young children. Uh, and we go to this orphanage and we're really, I mean, I was not alone. Our group was not ready for it. So I will say this, when we got to the, the orphanage, there was a lot of smiles. So there was a, a, an orphanage for girls and there were a lot of smiles. The girls were all very, very happy to see us. Um, and we were fed a meal of some sort of stew. Um, don't think those sacred cows don't get nailed every once in a while. I mean, that's part of the, the thing that goes on, I've had other people say that, but we were fed some sort of stew, which was good. I enjoyed the food in India. Um, but then the girls, they wanted to sing some songs for us. So we sat and they sing in their songs. It really was quite endearing and they were very good. Well, then they wanted us to get up and sing a song. So we, we, there was one song that we had done that somebody showed us some sort of thing and it's t uh, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. And there's a way of clapping each other's hands as you go down the line. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together. So we sang that. 
And they wanted us to sing another one. Oh, we don't know another song. Yeah, here we have a bunch of, you know, it's a couple seminary professors, a bunch of seminary students, and a few pastors, and we don't know another song. <laughs> but we sang, we sang that song again. I think we butchered up another song that someone thought that we might know. So they sang us another song, and then they wanted to dance. And they wouldn't let you say no. So they started playing, actually, I think it was top 40s music. Um, and they started dancing, and they pulled us all up. Somewhere in the midst of this, that grumpy, tired, middle-aged person who just really wanted to go back and huddle to himself found a generous spirit of love and joy and peace. Somewhere during the midst of this, those five loaves of bread and two fish, which were the meagerness of maybe the compassion that was left between our whole group, was blessed and broken and shared. And we found a joy that is indescribable. And the little bus going back to where we were staying that night, rather than being a bunch of tired, grumpy people was a group of people that were overjoyed and energized and sharing ideas. And the place itself, the seminary, the, the orphanage itself, the woman explained to us her philosophy. She would get children that would be either, they came from a uh, Hindu tradition or a Muslim tradition or maybe a Christian tradition. Well, she raised the Hindus as good Hindus she raised the Muslims as good Muslims, and she raised the Christians as Christians, teaching them to live in their faith and to live together. And she said she received enough money from between the church and the government to take care of 50 girls. And she usually had well over 100. But she said there was always enough. Somehow, and I can't explain how, I wish I could explain how, those five loaves of bread and two fish that she were given to operate with were f multiplied to feed the, the crowd. And not only feed the crowd, but to feed some tired, cranky seminary students. And there was abundant joy, and there was abundant love. Why do we waste our time for bread that does not satisfy when God has given us his own child and sacrificed his own child so that we can live a life of joy and happiness and blessing, not burdened down by our own brokenness. Amen.
In Christ you have heard the word of faith, the gospel of salvation. We believe in, in him and are marked, marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Spirit. <clears throat> Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe, I believe in, in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You take resources that appear to be meager, bless them, and there is enough. May your church trust that you bless and ask us to share with the world as abundantly sufficient, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers substance, sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance for the well-being of all. Reverse the damage we have caused your creation. Replenish <clears throat> groundwater supplies. Provide needed rains in the place of drought and protect forests from wildfires. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and peoples of the earth, inviting everyone to abundant life. Bring the prophet <clears throat> vision to fullness that all nations will run to you and the nations who do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender <clears throat> hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs, especially Nancy Balacqua, Wendy Borst, Christine Cox, Isabel Geshwin, Isaiah, Robert Hummel, Violet Hummel, Bob Kelly, Florence Kelly, and Joy Waller. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give our congregation, King of Kings, such a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all who we encounter. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in the body of Jesus. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving the saints we have known. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up those concerns that we have in our heart that are not named here. We lift up those people who are not named here that we are praying for. And we lift up our nation in this time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also, also with you. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament, I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you in my soul. 
Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Amen. And now, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God.